All right, dealing with divorce, difficult questions, biblical answers. This is lesson number five in the series. It's entitled Domestic Violence, The Secret Sin. And uh, there's so much material in this, I've broken this up into two parts. So we'll do part one this morning. <laughs> okay, one of the major uh, fallacies that we in the church seem to live with is that there's no family violence that takes place in the marriages of people who are Christians, who go to church on a regular basis. Uh, of course, when everybody's singing Amazing Grace on Sunday morning together, there's a picture of unity and peace as everyone gathers cheerfully for worship. Good morning, how are you? We're fine, Did you have a nice weekend? You know, it's all wonderful. But I can tell you that one, once worship is over, a lot of wives and children go home to a situation of abuse that stays hidden because of fear or shame. So in this series on dealing with divorce, I want to include, as I said, two lessons on one of the least talked about causes of divorce, which is domestic violence. And I, as, as I said, I've been preaching for 37 years. I have never heard a sermon on this where I was or where I have attended. We rarely, rarely talk about this in public. It's a big problem, a big problem. So with these two lessons on this topic, I'm going to try to do a couple of things. One, educate us on the subject of abuse. Two, provide uh, some handouts, and I'll do that at the end of the class. Uh, information to help those who are in this situation or people you know who are in this situation. And thirdly, look at, of course, what does the Bible teach concerning abuse and what the abused can do in that situation. Uh, there's no you know, heading in the Bible that says, heading domestic violence, but, but it's, it's there. Uh, so hopefully those uh, who might be experience this, experiencing this as either you know, a brother or you know, a, as a batterer or as a victim or those who know that this is going on in other people's families, hopefully they'll find hope and they'll find help uh, beginning with this particular lesson. So let's start uh, basically with some definitions, shall we? Domestic violence. Uh, is violence occurring between partners or between children and adults in an ongoing domestic relationship. And this particular two lesson series is going to focus on violence between adults. There's all, you know, it works a lot of different ways, but I'm going to focus just violence between adult. Child abuse, this is an entirely different issue. It has different causes, different patterns. So you, know, you can't do everything in two lessons. So I'm going to focus on abuse between two adults. Now most domestic violence is directed against women, although there are some cases where it is the man who is abused. And of course, again, we have to kind of narrow down our focus for this, uh, these few lessons. We're going to deal with violence against women because this is the um, case, uh, the majority of the cases, 85% uh, domestic violence, violence against the women uh, according to the Huffington Post, uh, an article on domestic violence, a series that they had recently. Let's look at some statistics, shall we? Um, a national Network to End Domestic Violence uh, gives out some statistics. 37% of hospital visits, the ER, are by women due to domestic violence, 37%. 50% of all homicides of female spouses committed by partners after divorce or separation. Violence against pregnant women causes more birth defects than all diseases combined. You know, a woman who's pregnant uh, seven months and she gets punched in the stomach, you, thrown onto the floor, kicked. Some um, state of Oklahoma statistics. In 2015, police responded to 36,000 domestic violence calls in Oklahoma City alone. 33% of all calls were for domestic violence. 41% of all homicides due to domestic violence here in our state. 70% of cases where an abused child dies, there has been a pattern of abuse against the mother. 
Don't ever wonder why the husband is always the very first suspect when the wife is killed or murdered or disappeared. You know, they say, well, that's not fair to the guy. They, they suspect him right away. Well, you know, the odds are, the odds are favorable that he is the one, not always, but. So domestic violence is with us, it's widespread and it's a great problem and it's naive to think that it doesn't happen to couples that are you know, in the church. Now a situation where a woman experiences repeated, deliberate and severe abuse resulting in physical and emotional injury. That's, that's abuse, that's battery. So abuse takes you know, various forms. There's physical abuse, pushing, slapping, kicking, punching, striking with a weapon. There's emotional and psychological abuse, threats of violence and death, verbal abuse, name calling, accusations, ridiculing. There's manipulation and domination, outbursts of anger, creating a situation where the woman is isolated from her family and friends. And then of course sexual abuse, marital rape, sadism, forced sexual activity, degradation. In other words, using sex as a tool of abuse rather than an instrument of love. So a battered woman is a person who experiences, and here's the key, a woman who experiences any one of these or a combination of these things. In most cases, there is a cycle of violence that increases and intensifies over the years. The batterers, the ones who cause the violence, are men who abuse their wives physically, emotionally, or sexually. Batterers have a certain profile of characteristics that are common. For example, they suffer from low self-esteem. They have difficulty trusting other people. They have little ability to nurture other people. In other words, it's always about them. They're perfectionists by nature and usually clean cut types. That's why the, you know, you're always thinking the batterer has got to be you know, a six day old beard and bad breath and he doesn't change his clothes. No. No, 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 no. Many times the batterer is like, whoa, outwardly is got himself together. They fear loss of control of any situation. So they overmanage. They're out of touch with their feelings other than the feeling of anger. And they tend to hold in their emotions. They have many times dual personalities. Extremely jealous, extremely possessive. And the dual personality is like, okay, who's going to appear today? Nice Joe or you know, bad Joe? Which, which, who, who, who's going to be there today? They're unable to assume responsibility for their actions. It's never, the, the interesting thing about them is that it's all about them all the time, but it's never their fault. <laughs> it's always about them, but it's never their fault. Usually they blame the wife. The wife is responsible for all the trouble or other people. They come in all ages, nationalities, and social positions. Very rich, well-educated men are batterers and very poor, uneducated men can be batterers as well. They believe in male superiority and dominance. Many times there's a history of alcohol and drug abuse in themselves or in their families. There's also a history of abuse many times you know, they themselves come from a family where some of this was going on. They are oversensitive to insult or neglect. They, they're they're uh, thin-skinned. 
Now not every batterer has all of these characteristics, but most of them have a cluster of these in their personality profile. Next question would be, well, why do people behave violently? You know, why are they like this? It seems that people marry because they love each other and they want to be together. So why then is there such a degree of violence in marriage, even in Christian marriages? Why would that you know, be the case? Some recent research provides several suggestions as to the cause of domestic violence. First of all, previous family learning. Children who observe this kind of thing in their homes will more likely incorporate it into their own lives when they marry. You know the old saying, we tend to parent the way we were parented unless we change things, you know, but if we don't, we tend to, you know, you've never said to yourself, oh my, I, I sound like my mother or I sound like my dad. I've become my dad. You know? In my case, I've become my mother. <laughs> my dad, you know, he died when I was young, but I hear myself saying things to our children you know, that my mother used to say to me. So it's the same thing if someone comes from a home where there, where there was abuse. You know, a girl seeing her mother get slapped around may find it more normal if it happens to her. I know that you, you, you're thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense. But. Another reason, low self-esteem. We said that was the very first characteristic of the batterer, low self-esteem. Researchers don't know why, but husbands with low self-esteem seem to revert to violence against their wives more easily than those who have a better view of themselves. A lot of batterers said they were violent because their wives threatened their self-esteem. I'm going to show you you're not any better than me. I'm going to show you you're not any smarter than me. I'm going to show you you're getting uppity with me. So sometimes when you don't have an answer, you, know, you don't have an intellectual answer, the fist is a pretty good intellectual answer. It gets your, it gets your point across. Another reason, displacement of tension. The husband takes out his stress from work, failure, fear, etc. He takes all of this out on his wife and children in this way. The spouse may be blamed for the partner's failure or stress and this is a way of kind of getting it back. And then of course the reinforcement of violence. If the batterer succeeds in getting his way through violence well, they're going to use it again. Are you kidding me? This worked last time. Another reason for domestic violence, and we're, you know, for those of you who've come in a little bit after we started, uh, we, we've narrowed it down to violence, the, the husband against the wife. There are other kinds of domestic violence, but we're focusing on the, the husband is the, is the batterer and the wife is the one who is uh, receiving the, uh, the violence. So we're giving some reasons for this. Another reason, no referee. You know, marriage is a private affair and the abuse is rarely seen or checked by some objective observer. So when there's no restraint, then batterers feel free to use violence without any interference. If your mother happens to live or your mother-in-law happens to live with you for whatever reason, she's there, she can be a witness. But in situations where there's nobody, well, there's nobody to interfere. Another reason, violence in our society. Social models for violence on television and in movies create a norm for violence in society. Sure, people get shot all the time, people get beat up, there are fights you know, in movies. How does the hero solve the issue? Have you ever seen in a movie there's an issue or you know, a drama between two characters and they say, you know, let's call in a third, a third person to mediate our differences and let's just talk it out. That would be the most boring movie. Who would go? No, when there's, a, when there's some sort of dispute, how do they settle it usually in a movie? Well, there's a fist fight. There's a gunfight. Well, you know, we wonder, does that have any effect? Well, 
You see, you, you see that image and that story 5,000 times in your life, you start to think, you know what, that may be a way to solve my issue here with my wife. People become desensitized to violence in general and then to domestic violence in particular. Cultural conditioning. Wife beating was not only a social norm but protected in many cultures. You know, you can translate this into a lot of different language and social situations. You know, quote, keeping her in line was socially acceptable even if it meant keeping her in line was done through violent means. That's why this, this lesson is called the secret sin. It's secret. And then number eight, the misunderstanding of scriptures. Remember I said one of the, one of the key issues about the, the profile of the batterer was that uh, he was all about male dominance and male you know, superiority in the marriage and the women needed to submit. And so he was, he, he's all about that. He, he, he's all about that idea. But that is a, a gross misunderstanding of scriptures and also a misapplication of the passages that deal with the role of men and women in marriage and in the church. And this has led to abuse. Many men have trusted or rather twisted the scriptures to justify the mistreatment of their wives. Yeah, sure, the Bible says that the wives need to be in submission to their husbands, but do we read the next passage that, that says, and then you husband, it says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, exactly how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave his life for the church. You can't twist that scripture to justify the beating of your wife, come on. So you could add a lot of other factors like substance abuse or emotional illness. You take a person that has that, those uh, characteristics and you add to that a mental disorder. You've got a dangerous mix. In addition to human weakness. So, but these are, these are some of the, you know, the profile of the normal batterer and some of the reasons why there is a violence in the home. Not all the reasons, but some of the reasons. Now there's a cycle of violence. In studying relationships where violence is a regular occurrence, researchers have found a cycle or a pattern that shows up in relationships where there is violence. It is a cycle, so it is, it is hard to say where it begins, but the first obvious clue that you're in this cycle of domestic violence, of course, is well, there's a violent episode. You know, it could just be a shove or some very ugly words or throwing something at the other person or something worse. All of a sudden, it just comes out. All of a sudden. Pew. Then there's the crisis state. The batterer feels remorse. He asks for forgiveness. The victim is lobbied for forgiveness. Flowers are brought, promises to go to church, to go to counseling, you know, all of those things. And of course, counselors say, this is the best time to take a new direction and deal directly and effectively with the problem. Go to the counseling, get this thing out in the open, deal with it. But that's not usually what happens. Usually what happens is it gets swept under the rug. Well, it was just a one-time thing. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to drag our business in front of everybody. We can't afford counseling. I mean, you know, give me 20 reasons why not to do. Then there's the honeymoon period, the high point in the cycle. Let's, let's take a vacation. We need a fresh start. We'll take a vacation, gifts. New plans, you know what, I'll finish that porch that I promised. All of these things to kind of cover over and paper over the ugly incident. He's sweet, he's kind. And of course the honeymoon period moves the victim to forget, to not go through 
with the counseling or not continue with the counseling, not to take any legal action. The next stage is calmness. We go back to normal, normal life. The incident happened, it's back there, it was nine months ago, that was then, this is now, we're different people, we're just going to move on. And then the longest period is the stress period because new problems or stressors begin to pile up. Isolation, maybe alcohol or drugs or pornography are consumed. Perhaps there's a pregnancy that takes place. You know, the, they don't call it the honeymoon for nothing. Or maybe you know, a death in the family or maybe a role change. There may be a change in family structure, a medical problem, sexual dysfunction or sexual interruption. Yes, I know you want to have sex, but you know I'm not quite ready. I'm still remembering the punch in the face. <laughs> I'm needing to get over that a little bit. You need to give me just a little more time. Causing the stress. Once the stress factors build up again, they lead to another violent episode. And if not interrupted by legal or counseling intervention, this will simply begin the cycle over again. In most cases, the cycle gets shorter and more violent. More violent. We go from a shove to a slap to a punch to I grab you by the throat. We go from simply shouting, I don't agree with you and blah, 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 to begin shouting obscenities. We go from shouting obscenities while we're alone to shouting obscenities in front of the children. You know, it just, it gets worse. It doesn't get better. The point is that if you don't actually do something like a true intervention, it'll get worse. This type of thing never gets better all by itself. Now, one of the big questions is why men, why do they do this? All indications are that domestic violence is an effort to obtain and maintain power and control over the wife. Batterers have a, an inordinate need to maintain power and control over their spouses and will use violence and abuse to obtain it. Here are some of the methods that they use. Threats. Threaten the wife, threaten the children, even threaten to kill themselves. I don't know what I'll do to myself if, if this gets out and if my parents ever find out. I mean, I just couldn't live with that. Threats to force her not to leave, not to press charges, and certainly don't tell. Intimidation. Looks, gestures, words that suggest disapproval, violence. Destroying property, displaying weapons. And nothing's more intimidating to a wife who's, who's the, 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 the victim of abuse that her husband is pulling out his, weapon, his gun you know, at the table and you know, <laughs> Emotional abuse, putting her down, playing mind games, humiliation, humiliating her in front of other people, putting guilt trips on her. Well, if it wasn't for you, we'd be a success. Getting the message across that if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be like this. I was okay before you and I got together. Look what you've done to me. You've made me into this monster. This is about the closest that a batterer will ever come to admitting fault. He'll say, I am a batterer, but it's your fault. I'm the way I am because of you. <laughs> Not because of me, because of you. Isolation, controlling who she sees, what she does, what she wears, what she reads using jealousy to justify actions. The thing that, uh, the, the one um, uh, you know, uh, strategy in a phrase, I love you so much that I just can't you know, see you <laughs> go visit your mom. Or <laughs> you know, 
I'm the way I am and I restrict you and I isolate you and I control you and I manipulate you and I humiliate you. You know why? Because I love you so much that if I have one problem, it's that I love you too much. I mean, what do we call that? Manipulation with a capital M. Blaming. Not taking her fear or concern seriously or saying that the abuse actually didn't happen. That's all in your head. Punch, ah, uh, come on. I was kind of holding back and my, you know, my hand got in your face. And of course saying she's the one who caused it. She provoked it, you provoked me. Using children, using children to relay messages. Go tell your mother. Go tell your mother. Using visits in a, a situation where the couple is separated. Using visits to harass or threatening to take the children away. Using male privilege. Sorry for the typo there. Using male privilege treating her like a servant. And again, we talked about this, misapplying scripture to justify abuse. Using economic abuse, preventing her from working, preventing her from having her own access to money, preventing her from knowledge about the finances or the use of the family finances. Now it's one thing, you know, if she, you handle the money, I handle this other thing. You know, I mean, you know, couples do that. They, they divide up, the, uh, they divide up the, uh, the jobs, right? The responsibilities in the home. That's, that's pretty normal. You know? In our home, I, you know, I'm not good with numbers and things like that. My wife handles that. And I trust her. I, I couldn't tell you how much money we have in the bank. I, you know, I don't know because I, I trust her. But I know I, if I ever said to her, hey, can I just see, you know, where, we, where, where is all our big expenses going? She pull everything out, we go over it together. It's when you don't, you're not allowed to see the numbers. Okay, now that's a, different, that's a different story. And then of course, using sexual aggression. The use of sexual aggression to break her spirit. Degrading type of sexual activity to degrade her sense of personal worth. There are two main types. A Dr. Jacobson, his book, When Men Batter Women. Interesting, he says there are two main types of batterers. One he calls the cobras. The cobras. The cobras, they're the type they get calm inside as the outside gets excited. The calmness makes the aggression more effective. They strike very quickly and viciously. The cobras, they know that they are batterers, but they don't care. <laughs> it's what I do. It's how I get my way. Then there are the, what he calls the pit bulls. The pit bulls, they're excited inside and out. You know? And once they get going, they don't let go. The pit bulls are the ones who are the stalkers the ones that can't take any abandonment. The pit bulls are the ones that see themselves as the victim. Now remember, however, that all of these things are tools used by the batterers. They're not ends in themselves. I mean, batterers are actually uh, looking for victim types in order to get their control needs met. They are tools to gain and keep and increase power and control over the wife and the children because the goal is total control. The goal isn't violence. It isn't abuse. That's the means to the goal. The goal is absolute total control of that other individual. So there's always a first question people ask when we talk about this, and that is, well, why doesn't the woman just get out? Call the cops. 
Women who stay in violent relationships undergo gradual steps of reasoning to reconcile the violence that they're undergoing at the hands of someone that they love, remember. The reasons that she stays change as the violence in the relationship progresses. At first, stage one, she stays because she loves him. She believes that, well, he'll grow up, he'll change. She'll be able to control the beatings by being more careful to please him. Well, I know that that really bothers him. You know, when he's hungry and you know, we haven't had supper, I better not bring up any issues with the kids. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll change. She believes she can reason with him. She can make it work if she just tries a little bit harder. She believes his apology after, uh, you know, after a session of abuse, uh, physical, emotional, whatever, and then he's sorry and oh, I love you so much. Blah, blah, blah. She believes that. And of course she's embarrassed, she's afraid of what will happen if you know, I call the police, are you kidding me? We'll have to go to court, what about my kids? The After all, if he goes to jail, who's going to buy the food? You know, these are real concerns. It's not like in the movies. In the movies, nobody goes to work. You ever notice that? <laughs> nobody goes shopping. You know, the characters have brand new clothes every second scene. You, know, you ever see them going shopping for that stuff? In real life, we go shopping, we have to buy food, we have to pay the electric bill. And if there's only one earner in the family, and that earner is the batterer, I'm thinking twice about calling the cops and throwing them in jail. Stage two, as the cycle continues, well, she loves him less. She stays, however, because she hopes he'll change or get some help. Things will get better. She's under pressure from family and friends and the church to stay. Well, divorce, you know, that's, that's wrong. She believes he still loves her. He still needs her. She's afraid to be alone. She won't be able to support herself. And then, you see, remember we said at the beginning, the profile, he's usually a pretty clean cut guy, nice guy. She married him to begin with. There had to be something there. And the problem is everybody loves him. The other him, the good Bob. You know, there's the good Bob and there's the bad Bob. Well, everybody, he always shows the good Bob to everybody. Well, everybody loves the good Bob. Everybody thinks they're an ideal couple. Maybe she just, she doesn't believe in divorce. I mean, as Christians, we don't believe that divorce should be or is an option. In the end, she stays because she's afraid of his power. She stays because she believes his threats to harm her or her children. He'll actually do it. She stays because she's developed low self-esteem. She stays because she doesn't think that she can survive alone. She feels helpless, depressed. She stays because she becomes immobile, unable to make a, a, a decision. She's confused and most of all, and here is the weird part, she feels guilty. She's the one that's getting beaten, but she feels guilty. So if not stopped, she either becomes suicidal, homicidal, or goes into survival mode simply to stay alive from day to day. How many women, they just, they're just surviving. All right, so next week, I'm going to talk about some of the legal aspects of this issue and what women should do if they find themselves in this situation. Next week we'll also look at the Bible. You know, we haven't looked at a lot of Bible passages because this is all, you know, we're ramping up to that, giving you some background. But we will look at the Bible, what it has to say about all of this for the batterers, for the victims, and for the marriage itself. Does the Bible address this? And it does. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to leave you with some uh, information uh, that Hal is going to uh, give you before we leave. Then I have a couple of other things that I want to share with you and then we'll be done for, uh, for today. A couple of takeaway ideas here aside from just the information gathering that we had. Remember that it happens in the best of families. One of the best weapons used by batterers is silence. Nobody tells. Nobody deals with it. 
Family reputation is no reason to excuse family violence. Number two, beating somebody is wrong. I mean, I thought that would be a, a given here. Hurting somebody else, using violence or intimidation to control another person is first of all a sin and it is also a crime. And we're going to deal with this next week, but we need to realize that Paul says that those who have jealousy and outbursts of anger will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. We always quote Galatians about homosexuals, you know, uh, drunkards, homosexuals, you know, liars, they're not going to uh, go to heaven. And then we stop there, but we don't talk about the people who have outbursts of anger, people who are violent, they're not going to go to heaven either. Well, what are batterers? Well, <laughs> Outbursts of anger, violence. And then of course, there is help and there is a way out. In Oklahoma, there are a lot of resources, counseling centers. There are laws that protect those who are caught up in the cycle of domestic violence. The key is to begin making a plan. And I'll give you all the information you need to to have about those things next week when we get together. Okay, well that's our lesson for this morning.